Aloha, I'm Lila Berg, and we're here at Sea Life Park, ready to meet the people who inform, inspire, and impact our daily lives. Thank you for tuning in to Island Focus. So what room is this? This is our fish preparation room for the park here. With a lot of buckets. There are a ton of buckets, <laughs> and that's what we sort the fish into, actually, our good fish and our bad fish for the animals. So every animal here gets fish yes. of some sort. And where does the fish come from? So it actually comes from the mainland because there's no sustainable fisheries here in Hawaii. Um, so we actually have to order the food from there, even Canada. Um, and then it's brought over here on boat. Are they in the fridge? It actually is, yes. <laughs> So this is the type of fish that we get. And we have capelin, herring, and even squid in here. Um, but this is in a freezer that's kept at a constant temperature overnight and actually has to go through a 24 hour thawing process. So this fish was pulled this morning at around nine o'clock and we'll sort it tomorrow at six. So how many pounds are we talking about on a daily basis or a yearly well, basis? On a daily basis, if you think about it, we actually have broken it down that we sort around 8,000 individual fish a day. And what are you looking for? And that's why these buckets are here. So we're looking for the quality of the fish. Uh, we make sure our animals receive the best quality possible. Is that why this board exists? <laughs> I see all their names here. Yeah, so this is actually broken down into segments of the park of which area in the animals that we have. So we have um, lagoon in our dolphins and this is the type of fish that they get and the amount and we also have penguins and even seabirds here so it's different and they get different amounts of fish and species of what fish. determines what they get so basically their age weight activity level and caloric value of the different types of fish so you get the fish then they're weighed or yes. they're sorted and then they're weighed. sorted we hand pick through them we get rid of the waste ones that have any tears or rips in them and they get the best and we weigh it out and then they actually go into their each individual cooler they have their own names on them fabulous it makes me feel like I'm connected with them just knowing their names. Thank you yeah, so much. For sure. <laughs> Today on Island Focus, you will have the pleasure of meeting Sean Moss, who is Executive Director for the Oceanic Institute. Mahalo for being with us. You have an exciting job being out here on this coast. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Maybe explain a little bit what your institute does and what we can look forward to. Sure. Well, this, this parcel of land has a fascinating history. About 60 years ago, a gentleman named Tap Pryor envisioned on the the Hawaii Kai side of the property for there to be a, a marine park for the public display of marine organisms, a commercial company. And today that company is Sea Life Park. On the Waimanalo side of the property, Tap Pryor envisioned a marine research institute, a nonprofit research institute. And these two organizations would integrate over the lifetime of Tap Pryor's vision. And today what we have again is Sea Life Park on the Hawaii Kai side and Oceanic Institute of Hawaii Pacific University on the Waimanalo side. But side by side. Side by side, <laughs> that's right. And so Tap Pryor's vision still is manifesting today somewhat 60 years later. So even though Sea Life Park does research and rehabilitation protection of mammals um, and ocean species, Oceanic Institute is a little more specific. The majority of our life at OI, and I've been there over 30 years, we've dedicated our efforts towards largely aquaculture research. Our mission is largely now to develop and transfer uh, environmentally sustainable technologies to increase aquatic protein production while simultaneously promoting the sustainability of ocean resources, protecting ocean resources. So we really are at this nexus of food security and marine conservation. Those are huge concepts. Yes, they are. They're <laughs> Can huge. you break it down a little bit for us? <laughs> sure. Well, on the, on the food security side, by 2050, we're supposed to have somewhat between 9.5 and 10 billion people on the planet. Mm. And our wild fisheries resources, uh, many are at or beyond maximum sustainable yield. So in order to kind of bridge this chasm between supply and demand of seafood products, 
aquaculture will continue to play a pivotal role in meeting a growing world's demand for seafood products. So in 2014, we merged with Hawaii Pacific University, and now Oceanic Institute is part of the HPU Ohana. And on our property, we have some excellent faculty, marine science faculty from HPU, where they're teaching students in areas of cetacean biology, marine debris problems, microplastic problems. And the Oceanic Institute researchers are largely engaged in fish and shrimp aquaculture. It must be very, I guess, positive also and hopeful for you to see these young people not only getting degrees, but actually living and experiencing and, and feeling what the passion that you feel. Oh, absolutely. I think the younger generations, they're very Akamai about local food sustainability issues. I think a lot of people realize that we don't grow a lot of food here in Hawaii. We import uh, 80 to 90 percent of the food we eat. And, you know, we are very susceptible if food supply chains get compromised coming to Hawaii. So it is becoming imperative that we learn how to grow our own food here. And one way we can do that is through sustainable aquaculture. It's for our own survival, but I imagine it also has economic consequences in a positive way Absolutely. for Hawaii's future. Absolutely. Our economy here locally relies largely on tourism and, and the military to support a lot of jobs, but I think aquaculture in particular and agriculture in general could create a lot of jobs and opportunities. We need government support, federal and state support. We need uh, public-private partnerships, but importantly, we need the technology to figure out how to grow aquatic protein production in the context of aquaculture, how to do that in a sustainable way, and to transfer that know-how to young students who can then carry the ball forward. One last message for the public. I think we need to understand that Hawaii has these incredible assets here. We've got one of the most beautiful oceans in the world surrounding us with clean seawater. We've got bright, young, energetic people, and we can integrate these wonderful resources to help create a sustainable food supply here for Hawaii's people. And great surf. And great surf. <laughs> Thank you so much Thank for joining you. us. We've had the opportunity to meet Sean Moss, who's the executive director of Oceanic Institute. Appreciate you being with us. What an opportunity we have today to meet Laura Ka'akua, who is the CEO of Hawaiian Islands Land Trust. Thank you so much, Lila. Thank you. And your organization does more than focus on land. The core of our, our work is connecting the people of Hawaii back to the land. And so land protection, either through fee simple purchase or restricting future land use is one way to do that. Taking care of land and welcoming the surrounding community to help us steward land when we own those preserves ourselves is another way. And really our end goal is just a people of Hawaii that know their place and know their own identity really because they know where they're from. So help us understand how, what that means uh, to the general public. I guess just being here, we're actually in Kalpo, right? This is the historic fishing uh, village of Kalpo uh, in Waimanalo. And so this coastline is protected and not every community has that in their backyard. And protected so, means no commercial development. Right, that's right. And so, you know, either through state, um, Department of Hawaiian Homelands or the city along this coastline, the coastline is really protected for the benefit of the community. I think what really inspires that protection effort is just knowing the history of the place. Mm. And so we're here in Kalpo, this mountain area above us is Kalapueo, and that's actually famed in story. And that was the place where all of the owls from Maui and Lanai and Hawaii Island and Molokai, just across Kaivi Channel, actually gathered there to go and protect um, Kapo'i, who had come to be a friend and trusted 
spokesperson of one of the Awa leaders. And so this Kalapueo area and Waimanalo in general is full of stories, as but is every, every island, place. Yes. Every island has its special places. And I think we sort of take it for granted that since it's coastline, there will be no development. But right. it's a very deliberate effort your organization makes. That's right. And usually what happens is just a few people, just a small handful of folks will look at a certain place. Maybe they know the history. Maybe they have to go and ask Kupuna about the history of a place. That place will typically be threatened with a land use that doesn't really honor mm. how the land functioned in the past. And so they'll get together. And that's really how a land trust starts is just people that are absolutely dedicated to protecting a certain area because of its history, its cultural significance, the ecosystem there. And that's how the land trust in Hawaii form. The Hawaiian Islands Land Trust is really a collection of smaller land trusts that merged in 2011 and formed the islands-wide land trust. Well, and many of us growing up here didn't know the stories. Right. and or the songs or the significance of areas. To what do you attribute that now coming into public knowledge? I attribute a lot of it to our educators. I think place-based education in Hawaii is really a model and we see so many teachers that come out to the seven preserves that Hawaiian Islands Land Trust owns and stewards. And these are teachers that will take the time to really rework their entire math, science, writing, social studies curriculum around a place. And within that one place, for example, our Waihe'e refuge on Maui, we have teachers from Pomekai Elementary there that will entirely redo their curriculum to be working within the ahupua'a based model and we'll be teaching the kids about the particular features on the land. But it's so much more meaningful to, right. to learn That's content right. that way. That's right. Thank you so much for planting the seeds and we'll look forward to hearing thank from you, you. On another time. Yes, thank you so thank much. You. We've had the opportunity to listen to the conversation with Laura Ka'akua, who is the Executive Director of the Hawaiian Islands Land Trust. Mahalo. I'm here with Chief Petty Officer Josh Williams of the United States Coast Guard. I think you'll enjoy this conversation. And I enjoy meeting you because the Coast Guard is such an important entity here in Hawaii. Yes, yes it is. What is your role with them? So I'm the officer in charge of the AIDS Navigation Team Honolulu, and we maintain AIDS Navigation throughout Hawaii, which include lighthouses, some of the buoys or structures that just guide mariners into harbors or keep them safe. So behind us is Makapu Lighthouse. Yes. Is that part of your responsibility? It is. It's one of our lighthouses that we maintain. So we work on that. We'll go up there every two or three months to do general maintenance, cleaning the lens, and do other maintenance as needed there. It's a bit romantic to think of being in the Coast Guard and being near water and being of service. What are some of the challenges that you face in your role? For our role, we are based in Honolulu and we do cover all the islands, so it's um, always a challenge just to get to some of the places. They're very remote, but they are beautiful locations. So, uh, But there is a logistics challenge of going from, from here to the other islands and, uh, and working with that. <laughs> Did you grow up near the water that you like to work? <laughs> yeah, I grew up in uh, New England, so always close to the ocean. Really enjoyed going to uh, the main coast, coast of Maine, seeing the harbors, the, the, just the fishing boats and everything. So this was a chance to travel for me and also to really learn a trade and uh, be on the ocean. There's something to be said about people who grew up near the ocean or having an affinity for the ocean in terms of their stewardship. Mm -hmm. That's the purpose of the Coast Guard as well, isn't it? Absolutely. That's a major reason why we're here is to protect the environment and protect people. That's what it comes down to with the AIDS navigation mission. What are some of the challenges? Some of the structures, they'll rust after years. Right. They're right on the ocean. <laughs> or they'll so, float away. Yeah, <laughs> things will float away. So there's, there's always maintenance to be done. And then mm. there's things that you aren't really planning to happen. It's a constant that things will break down and uh, or the lights will be extinguished. So we're at Sea Life Park where we're learning about the mammals and other sea animals. 
Do you see them when you're out on the ships? A lot of our aids, because they are so remote, we'll see monk seals. And it's really neat, just the wildlife we'll see. The whales right here off of Makapu'u. I've been to Alaska also, stationed in Alaska, and just, you know, the wildlife's amazing. One word to someone who might be interested in joining. For me, it was the best decision I made if some, uh, because I was able to travel and uh, meet great people. You know, do a really interesting job that you're always learning something. For someone from here, you sometimes will be away from home, I'm sure, but you'll be near the ocean also. So it's really a great way to see more of the world. And when we're the, on the ocean, we're never far away from home, absolutely, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you very much for joining us. <laughs> Thank you. We've had a conversation with Chief Petty Officer Josh Williams of the United States Coast Guard. Appreciate you being with us. As the resident veterinarian here, you have a lot of different roles that you play. Yes, we do. We oversee the health care for all of the animals at the park. And so we have a lot of different things we have to do depending on the species of the animal. How do you know when an animal is sick? Especially because they're in the water. <laughs> yeah, it depends on the animal. They show us changes in their behavior, changes in their appetite. Sometimes it can be something as simple as, you know, their appetite's a little bit lower than normal. Sometimes they're lethargic and stuff. But it's generally, it doesn't get to the point that you might w wait with your dog or your cat. Um, we tend to be a lot more proactive um, in our observation of the animals and also assessment and treatment of them if necessary. So you must work very closely with the trainers. Yes, we do. Because very they closely. have this personal relationship yes. with each of their yes. animals. Preventative medicine is yes. essential. It really yeah. is. These species of animals mask disease in the wild, so if they're actually sick, they have to be really sick because out in the wild, something would eat them. So they would carry that trait over here mm -hmm. as well. So we actually very actively look for problems with them, very close attention to their, their appetite, their diet, how they're interacting with each other, how they're interacting with us. You take um, blood samples as yep. well? Blood samples, we look at samples from their nose, their stomach, basically anywhere that we think they might have a problem. We do a lot of proactive wound care with the animals. We all get cuts and scrapes and things like that. Same thing with the animals. And, um, so the trainers really help us out with that kind of thing, um, being really on the ball, taking care of these wounds every day. I'm at Sea Life Park with Elizabeth Riley, who is the founder of Livable Hawaii Kai Hui. Glad you could be with us too. Really wonderful to see you again. Thank you, Lila. Please help us understand how Livable Hawaii Kai Hui is connected with where we are. Sure. So we're sitting um, in one of the most spectacular scenic places on the Kaivi Coast. And the Kaivi Coast is particularly important to the Livable Hawaii Kai Hui because our mentors who helped us form the nonprofit in 2004 are from the Save Sandy Beach era. Historic. Historic, <laughs> amazing, brilliant people. Saving the Kaivi Coast was a 45-year, multi-generational mm -hmm. effort. And in 2004, when I set out to do community work and start a community nonprofit for the purpose of protecting cultural and natural resources, I was fortunate to work under the mentorship of Dave Matthews, Peter Rappa, and a bunch of other wonderful Save Sandy Beach heroes, visionaries. And that's how the organization was formed. So it started out with a specific purpose, and look at you now. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting because uh, originally when we set out in 2004, the issue wasn't anything on the Kaivi Coast. It was, if anything, a bit quiet because they had had um, great successes. We had set out in 2004 to protect the Camilla Nui Valley, agricultural valley, from urban encroachment. And in our effort to find leadership and grassroots organizing, meeting the Kaivi Coast Save Sandy Beach people, the livable Hawaii Kaihui was formed. So we serve East Honolulu from Makapu'u all the way through to and including a section of Kahala. But make no mistake about it, we know that we are well within the Ahupuaha of Waimanalo and very important ohana for us is in Waimanalo. So much of what we do um, as it relates to Kaivi and, and other cultural issues within our community, we do have our connections in ohana in Waimanalo because they are our cousins in community care. What I appreciate so much and I really I love is the way the communities come together. I've been fortunate to work on issues that took us from 
fighting the fight and picketing downtown at Honolulu Hale <laughs> to coming up with great strategy on how to protect the last private land and acquiring it and purchasing it with the help of the Trust for Public Land, fundraising with Ohana from Waimanalo to lots of people throughout the island, to exceeding our mark financially. So Livable Hawaii Kaihui actually purchased yes. the area. We did. The last two remaining private parcels of land were Mauka, and there had been slated cabins and other types of recreational uh, facilities. But it had been the intent of the community for many generations to keep the entire Kaivi coast in its wild and natural state, Mauka Chimakai. Purchasing those lands and stewarding them and providing public access is very important to the health of the overall Kaivi coast. And, and that was the capstone project that had occurred two years ago. You know, and for many of us who donated to that effort, mm -hmm. um, it was very reassuring to know that a community could get involved and actually succeed. Yeah, and that's interesting because, yes, you were right there helping <laughs> along. It was a very intense three months summer program, yeah. summer of 2015. We were tasked with raising um, probably about, uh, I think, about three hundred to four hundred thousand dollars, and we not only raised the funds but we exceeded it by 200000 thus allowing us to have nice seed money to move forward in caring for the lands. And I know you have educational hikes and, and periodic sessions um, that are available that we'll see on your website. One of the beautiful things that's happening now along the Kaivi Coast is the formation of new partnerships. And we are celebrating, we're researching, we're learning, we're sharing back with the community. Another way to celebrate Kaivi is through the Kaivi Explorations. So 2020 will be the third year that we do it. We bring in partners, Kamehameha Schools, Hui Nalu, the Trust for Public Land, the Sierra Club, DLNR, just a lovely mix of individuals that come together. We plan for six months, and then we open up the Malka lands for four days of Malama the Aina and also hiking. We create trails and there's native vegetation to see. Come join us yeah, for an exploration. Will do, definitely. Thank you. What a pleasure it was to meet Elizabeth Riley, founder of Livable Hawaii Kai Hui. Stay tuned for more. I'm here with Dr. Diane Paloma, who is the CEO of Luna Lilo Home. Glad you could be with us. Luna Lilo Home has history for all of us. As CEO, what makes it so special for you? Well, mahalo for having me here today, Laila. Not only is Luna Lilo here in the Ahupua of Waimanalo, so as you know, Waimanalo starts around where Hui Nalu Canoe Club is. So being a part of this Ahupua is important. Luna Lilo was established in 1883 as the will and codicil of King William Charles Luna Lilo to care for kupuna, tend to them, malama them, care for them. And we are still here over 136 yeah. years later doing that exact same thing. It's such a special place because it's not only a residence. So we have 42 beds, which is our traditional adult residential care home licensed by the state of Hawaii. But we also have an adult daycare program which is about 44 clients. And we do have an expansive meal program, which we partner with Hawaii Meals on Wheels and have some of our own private meal pay clients, some of them being delivered here to Waimanalo as well. You know, and with your varied background in the medical profession too, this facility provides more than just a place to live. So what we really try and do is provide not just physical support, but we do also provide a lot of emotional, spiritual, and not just for residents, but for their entire families. Knowing that a loved one is cared for is one of the most comforting things that you can do. And what we're trying to do at Luna Lilo now is just expand that mission and not just stay within our four walls of the care home, but to find other communities as well, because we're all gonna be needing kupuna care in the future. There's a cultural component, uh, just, and there's, a, I think, a myth that one needs to be part Hawaiian. Absolutely. So we do accept residents mm. and clients of all ethnicities. You do not have to be Hawaiian. What is important to realize is that the trust was left for Native Hawaiian residents. And so if you are Native Hawaiian, then you can apply for those parts of subsidy. So it's, it's subsidies to be there. Yes. 
In your position as CEO, what is the most joy that you have? Oh, I think it's actually the Kani Kapila every yeah. Friday. <laughs> the Sometimes Royal Hawaiian Band they, goes there too, yes, right? Yes, they do. <laughs> so we have so many wonderful volunteers and families and individuals that come to visit with the kupuna. On occasion, they'll make me dance. It's Person like a family, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Personally, I lost some of my grandparents very early on. So in a way, this is kind of full circle for me to, to come and care for a kupuna that I never had growing up. Any particular story that really touches you in the last few moments we had oh, to speak? Oh, absolutely. I'd say this, so just this past week, we had a program called Tea with Tutu. So we dress everybody up. <laughs> we transform the dining room into the, a theme of the day. And one of the family members came up to me and said, you know, I really see the changes that are happening here. And I'm so happy that you are here taking care of our kupuna and just having a lot of little added value things there. Well, you know, I really appreciate you sharing the joy because I can see it in your face that oh, it's yes. the place that you really want to be. Is. It is. A parting message to the audience. Just to remember us at Luna Lilo Home and we're trying to get to your communities as soon as possible. And we realize that this silver tsunami of the baby boomers is, is upon us. And so how do we serve more of our community with our limited resources and what we have. And maybe remind us very quickly where it's located. We are located at 501 Kekaulu Ohi Street in Hawaii Kai, in Hawaii Kai. right next to Kaiser High School. So when we look at the Ahapua'a, it's the embrace of the whole coastline. Absolutely, absolutely. Doing our part in our community. Well, thank you so much for joining Mahalo. us today. Mahalo, thank Appreciate you. you being here. Thank you too for joining me in my conversation with Dr. Diane Paloma, CEO of Luna Lila Home. Aloha. Mahalo to Sea Life Park for hosting us today and to you for tuning in to Island Focus. I'm Lila Berg. Aloha and malamapono. Take care of each other. See you soon. <laughs>